Good afternoon. Can I remind members of the COVID-related measures that are in place and that face covering should be worn when moving around the Chamber and across the Holyrood campus? The first item of business is portfolio questions, and the first portfolio questions is health and social care. If a member wishes to request a supplementary question, they should press the request to speak button during the relevant question or uh, indicate so in the chat function by entering the letter R. And I call question number one, Liz Smith. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how many people have received free personal care under Frank's law since it came into effect in 2019. Minister Kevin Stewart. Um, thank you, President Officer. Data on the implementation of free personal care to under 65s in line with other non-COVID-19 data collections was temporarily postponed due to the redirection of resources to the pandemic response. The Scottish Government restarted the collection of this data in August 2021 and it is scheduled to be published on the 10th of May this year. Ms Smith. Could I thank the Minister for that? I know that he agrees uh, that free personal care inspired by Amanda Capel and Frank's law should make a very substantial difference to under 65s across the country. But there is concern, uh, notwithstanding the delays, that its implementation has been slow. And I've certainly got several constituents who are asking about this. And of course, we know that there was the Freedom of Information uh, request from West Lothian Health and Social Care Partnership, uh, which shows from uh, 2019 to the end of 2021, only four people uh, under 65 had, uh, had actually applied for it and received it. Um, so notwithstanding the fact there's been a delay in the publication that is forthcoming on the 10th of May, um, will the Cabinet, uh, sorry, the Minister, consider uh, his position um, in relation to this issue and agree with my colleague Miles Briggs's proposal to institute a national recovery group in partnership with COSLA? Minister. Um, President Officer, I think we're doing a number of things uh, to ensure that we get this right. And I, I join uh, Ms Smith in paying tribute to Amanda Capel. I think we need to pay close attention uh, to the statistics that will be published in May to see how things are going right across the country to ensure that we are getting it right uh, for uh, under 65s. Um, we will continue uh, to do all that we can to ensure um, that our intentions here are implemented and that people get the care that they need and deserve. And I'm more than happy to continue to engage with Ms Smith uh, and Mr Briggs and others on this issue. Uh, we need to get it right for people, uh, and I uh, want to ensure that we do so. And supplementary, Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Can the Minister confirm that Scotland is the only nation in the UK to deliver free personal care? And can he advise as to how many people in Scotland have benefited from that policy since it was first introduced? Minister. Um, Presiding Officer, Scotland is the only nation in the UK to deliver free personal care. Uh, I'm very proud uh, at the moves that we have made here uh, to ensure that that policy is implemented. Um, according to the most recent statistics available, which were for 2017-18, almost 80,000 people in Scotland benefited from free personal and nursing care. This included over 30,000 people in care homes and over 47,000 people living in their own homes. The number of people who have received free personal care at home has also been increasing. This reflects our policy of supporting people to live at home uh, for as long as possible. And supplementary, Paul O'Kane. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, I won't be the only member in the Chamber who has had constituents in touch about having had their care packages cut or indeed having experienced delays in packages being put in place in the first time. And we know that the impact of those delays and cuts can be devastating. Does the Minister accept that addressing the workforce shortages in social care is critical to fulfilling Frank's law? And one way this could be addressed is by giving social care staff an immediate pay rise to £12 an hour, going up to £15 an hour. Minister. Um, President Officer, uh, the Government is very well aware of the improvement that is required in terms uh, of the social care workforce. And that's why uh, we have announced and funded uh, two pay rises uh, in the last um, few months. Um, I recognise that there is more to do in that front and fair work has to be at the heart of the agenda. 
uh, and it will be as part of the National Care Service. Uh, but we cannot wait uh, until the National Care Service comes into play. Uh, and that's why the Cabinet Secretary and I uh, will continue uh, to work uh, with health and social care partnerships and others uh, to ensure that we can do our level best uh, for the workforce who have done so much uh, during the course of this pandemic and before. Question number two, Claire Adamson. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it has taken to raise awareness of the potential risks to health and well-being of children posed by button batteries. Minister Marie Todd. Button batteries have been involved in truly tragic incidents of childhood injury and death. I was shocked by reports of the harrowing uh, death over Christmas of young Hugh McMahon. My sympathies are with his family, who I understand have close ties with Claire Adamson's constituency. The Scottish Government supports organisations such as the Child Accident Prevention Trust and the Royal Society for the Prevention of Accidents, which work tirelessly to publicise threats to children's health and well-being, including button batteries. We are engaging with them and with other stakeholders to identify what more can be done on this important matter. Claire Adamson. Thank the Minister very much for her um, answer and for her condolences, which I'm sure are shared across the, the Parliament today, um, for my young constituent who died so tragically. Um, the Cross-Party Group on Accident Prevention and Safety Awareness is, returns to this issue often. Um, within the last two years, we've had presentations on it, and our concern lies with the availability of fake goods online and fake goods in our shops, but also um, uh, with the concern that few parents are aware of the risks posed by these. So I wonder if the Minister would undertake to work with the UK Government's new um, working group uh, under Paul Scully MP, who is engaged in the um, trading standard aspect of this, but also work with the CPD to see how we can raise awareness in parents and carers of this potentially fatal health issue. Thank you. Minister. So let me first acknowledge the work done by Claire Adamson and the cross-party group which she convenes to highlight the risks of button batteries. The regulation of product safety is reserved to the UK Government and Ms Adamson is correct that the UK Minister Paul Scully MP recently proposed a working group to progress safety improvement in this area. And this comes against another tragic death last May um, which sadly seemed to foreshadow the death of Hugh McMahon. I can give absolute assurance that the Scottish Government will engage with the UK Working Group. Indeed, our officials have already had positive discussions with counterparts in Mr Scully's department around our eagerness to cooperate and to help drive forward extensive work to tackle the risks. And that eagerness to cooperate naturally extends to the cross-party group and any other partners in accident prevention. Question number three, Alexander Burnett. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to support the NHS and social care recruitment in rural areas. Cabinet Secretary Hamza Yusuf. Since 2016, we have supported the Scottish Rural Medical Collaborative to develop recruitment and retention measures, investing over £300,000 in 2020-2021. To support the recruitment of GPs to rural practices, we have allocated £200,000 to fund relocation expenses and £400,000 for golden hellos. We have established a graduate entry medicine programme with the university, universities of Dundee and St Andrews, uh, focusing on remote and rural medicine and healthcare improvement. We are also in the scoping stage for the creation of a centre of excellence for rural and remote medicine and social care. Alexander Burnett. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Now, in my constituency, the medical practices in Arford and Torfins have unfortunately, like many others across Scotland, been unable to recruit new GPs and have handed their contract back to NHS Grampian. Uh, I note the Cabinet Secretary's comments about the Scottish Rural Medicine Collaborative funding uh, uh, in previous years. Can I just ask if he will commit to increasing funding uh, to their programme, Rediscover the Joy of General Practice, uh, which seeks to provide GPs the opportunity to work in different parts of Scotland uh, and outline any other plans to incentivise uptake and recruitment in rural areas? Cabinet Secretary. I can say this is an exceptional, uh, exceptionally important point raised by uh, Alexander Burnett. I, I will explore uh, the increase uh, to funding because he's right, the Rediscover the Joy programme. Uh, it was an excellent programme, but we will also look to see what more we can do to incentivise. He knows we have plans uh, in place to increase uh, the, the, the numbers of GPs in Scotland. He 
he is absolutely right to say that that should be an equitable distribution, not just focused, for example, on the central belt, but also on our remote, rural and island communities as well. So I will look at the suggestion uh, that he has raised and I will come back to the member. A supplementary Faisal Chaudhry. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Cabinet Secretary, what step is the Scottish Government taking to facilitate continued NHS and social care recruitment from EU countries? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I thank uh, Voice of Trudy for, again, an exceptionally uh, important question. I think important, of course, in the NHS, but also very important in social care as well. Uh, I think, uh, as Voice of Trudy, uh, will have done uh, when I visit uh, care homes in my own constituency since Brexit, there is clearly an absence, a noticeable absence of those uh, European uh, workers who, who work tirelessly uh, to care for others in social care. So we are working uh, with the uh, UK government uh, uh, in relation to social care recruitment from, international, from, from, from overseas, including uh, the EU. Uh, we had a good meeting this morning, actually, a number of ministerial colleagues across government as part of the population uh, task force looking at uh, what we can do more in relation to migration for health and social care. So that work is, is underway. Where we can do that in Scotland, we will. Where we, we need to work across the, the nations of the UK, uh, we are doing that. But there is no doubt at all that the impact of Brexit on health and social care is absolutely being felt on the ground. A supplementary, Willie Rennie. I think we need a bit more urgency from the Health Secretary. Recruitment in my constituency of health and social care workers is dire. Just this week, there are 36 advertised vacancies in social care and 176 within the NHS. Isn't this the result of poor workforce planning and poor rates of pay in the social care sector? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, no, I, I don't agree uh, with that. In fact, uh, in the time that I've been Health Secretary, there's been two uplifts to pay for uh, social care, adult social care workers. Uh, what I would say uh, to Willie Rennie is that we're not waiting for international recruitment. I was simply answering, of course, Mr Chaudhry's uh, very good question. Uh, he will have noted that uh, when I stood here in Parliament in October as part of our £300 million winter package, uh, a core component of that was recruiting some more healthcare support workers, and uh, that included and includes in Fife. So there has been some recruitment in Fife. I'm happy to provide him offline with further detail to that. But I take his point. The number one issue that we are dealing with in relation to, to, to social care is workforce, workforce, workforce. So I promise him there is no lack of urgency for myself, uh, my colleague Kevin Stewart, uh, or the government uh, on this very important issue that he raises. Question number four, Stephanie Callaghan. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the rollout of its National Cancer Plan. Cabinet Secretary. The National Cancer Plan is tracked against key milestones and regularly reported on to the National Cancer Recovery Group. Uh, overall, the plan is progressing well, notwithstanding uh, the effects of the pandemic. On our flagship actions, I can report Scotland's first three early cancer diagnostic centres uh, are now live in NHS Ayrshire and Ireland, Dumfries and Galloway and Fife, and initial preliminary data uh, on, that looks, on those centres looks positive. Uh, we have 12 single point of contact pilots trialling a person-centred approach to supporting patients throughout their cancer journey. The digital prehabilitation resource is in development and it's anticipated to go live with the nutrition and psychological wellbeing frameworks this spring. And lastly, the Scottish Cancer Network is established supporting our Once for Cancer, uh, Once for Scotland approach to cancer services. Stephanie Callaghan. I thank the Minister for that answer. Can you further advise how the Detect Cancer Early programme and the National Cancer Screening programmes are being adapted to respond to the continuing health inequality gap? Cabinet Secretary. I think it's an exceptionally important question. And I think Stephanie Callaghan may well have been at the uh, debate that we had uh, that uh, was secured by Jackie Bailey in relation to World Cancer Day uh, last week. It was an important debate and a number of the colleagues um, raised the issue of the, 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 the cancer care gap and the inequality gap. And uh, What I would say is uh, one demonstration of how we're tackling that inequality gap, and there's still work to do, of course there is, one demonstration I think of how we're tackling that is if we looked at lung cancer in, partic in particular, and our 44 million uh, detect cancer early programme, it aims to increase uh, the proportion of bowel, breast and lung cancers diagnosed at stage one while reducing health inequalities. And through that work, uh, we've seen that the proportion of lung cancers diagnosed at the earliest stage have increased by 45 per cent and, 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 and by 53 per cent in the most deprived areas <coughs> of Scotland. So there is more work to do right across the various different cancer types, but reducing that inequality gap is absolutely key to the recovery of our cancer services. A supplementary, Jackie Bailey. I wonder whether I could push the Cabinet Secretary slightly further on that, because um, there is a shocking 20 percentage point gap 
in bowel screening between people in the most deprived and the least deprived areas. Um, and it is indeed a matter of, I think, great shame that the most deprived in our communities remain at the greatest threat due to late cancer diagnosis. We know already since the start of the pandemic, almost 30,000 of our fellow Scots have died from cancer. So can I press the Cabinet Secretary on what urgent action the Government is taking to encourage the uptake on screening across all cancers in our most deprived communities? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I agree with um, Jackie Bailey's characterisation that that's unacceptable, and uh, she was right to raise that in the debate uh, that she did, and right to raise it again uh, today. That we have allocated £2 million over 2021, 22, and 22, 23 to continue our cancer and equality screening programme to tackle inequalities and encourage those who are eligible to take up their invite to the cancer screening programme. Uh, this is in addition to the £5 million we invested in the previous um, five years following feedback. Um, will no longer ask for bids for individual, often small-scale projects. Instead, we've kind of developed a, bland, a, a brand, uh, a blend, sorry, of, of, of national-based approaches, uh, complemented by local investments. Uh, so there's more to do in this. We are investing in that inequalities uh, gap, that cancer care gap that uh, Jackie Bailey and Stephanie Callahan uh, have spoken uh, about. And let me say that as we recover. Our cancer services, which is my number one priority, of reducing that inequality gap is a key component of that. Question number five, Mercedes Vialba, who is joining us remotely. I think my mic is on now. Uh, um, to ask the Scottish Government... Please, please continue. We can hear you now, Ms Vialba. Please pose your question. Thank you. OK, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on what steps it is taking to improve the provision of services for NHS Tayside breast cancer patients. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government officials are currently working closely with the HR Director and Chief Executive of NHS Tayside to support the Board to take forward a rebuild plan for recruitment of oncology consultants, specialist nursing and other support staff to deliver a local service. This will include options around international recruitment, uh, training schemes, marketing strategies and campaigns, uh, trainee placements and, and re-examining locum capacity too. It's our pro priority to ensure a locally delivered service for breast cancer patients in NHS Tayside. Mercedes Vialba. Thank the Minister for his response. Um, NHS Tayside today revealed that vacancies which leave the Health Board with no breast cancer oncology specialists remain unfilled. So there seems to be an issue um, with nationwide um, skills shortage. Um, so uh, the, the minister mentioned looking at all options, including international recruitment and training. Um, could he outline um, specifically um, what's being done to develop long -term, the long-term plan for training and recruitment for such spe specialists domestically? Cabinet Secretary. I think it's a very important point raised by Ms. Vialba. Ms. Vialba. Um, what I would say is NHS Tayside have undertaken a number of recruitment rounds and they haven't been able to fulfil those posts. And that isn't just unique to NHS Tayside. She's right to suggest that this is an issue uh, that is uh, broader than that. So we are looking at what we can do to uh, ensure that we can recruit, and I've, I've mentioned some of that in my opening answer, what we can do around uh, domestic recruitment, but international recruitment uh, as well. Uh, what we can do in around trainee placements and, and also looking at what we can do around locum capacity. Uh, but ultimately, I'm asking uh, my officials and uh, some others uh, externally to give us some assistance in relation to uh, what we can do to, f to fill uh, those oncology uh, uh, workforce gaps that we currently have, not just in Tayside, but right across Scotland. But let me say, although I'm referencing uh, the issues across Scotland, uh, they are, of course, most acutely felt in NHS Tayside. And let me just say, uh, without any equivocation, that the situation in NHS Tayside's breast uh, cancer service uh, to me is simply not a satisfactory one uh, and therefore one that is uh, again a priority for us to try to resolve. Question number six, Andrew Scohani. Thank you, Deputy Provising Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will meet its chronic pain clinic waiting time target during the current reporting quarter, 1st of January to the 31st of March. Minister Marie Todd. Public Health Scotland published waiting times for pain services from the data provided by health boards in line with their reporting schedule data for the quarter ending 31st March 2022 will be published in June. 
While I can't predict those figures, health boards have continued to make progress in restarting pain services during the pandemic, waiting times for the figures. Waiting times figures for the quarter ending September 2021 show almost 90 per cent of people referred to pain services were seen within the 18-week target. This is an improvement on the previous quarter, where almost 80 per cent of people were seen within the target. Sandish Gohani. Thank the Minister for that answer. In 2019, before the pandemic, some 3,000 patients were seen in a Scottish pain clinic each quarter. In quarter three, 2021, this number was around 1,900. Uh, the government announced a £240,000 chronic, uh, chronic pain winter support fund to enhance support for people with chronic pain. But we have yet to see a detailed plan on where this money will be spent and what patients will benefit. So my, my questions are, how much of this money has actually gone into health boards and other partners? Specifically, what will the money be used for? And compared with quarter three, 2021, how many additional patients do you anticipate will be seen in pain clinics during quarter one and two of 2022 as a result of your initiative? Uh, Minister. So, um, services are working extremely hard to tackle this issue, and there have been real impacts um, throughout the pandemic um, on people suffering chronic pain. And I understand just how incredibly difficult it is to continue to suffer chronic pain. And I, we are supporting um, boards to take action and making every effort possible to remobilise pain management services as quickly and as safely as possible. Um, owing to continued and expected pressures on pain services in the winter period, it is a challenge um, to uh, expect performance to improve over the next re reporting period. And in recognition of that challenge, we launched the Chronic Pain Winter Support Fund, which has provided almost £240,000 of funding to a range of national and local projects, which are intended to provide um, additional capacity and to support people with chronic pain right across Scotland in the coming months. And supplementary, Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Chronic Pain Service in NHS Lanarkshire has effectively been closed down for anyone needing pain relief injections. Again, I draw the government's attention to my constituent, Liz Barry, whose pain relief injection is overdue by three years. Liz, a former nurse and a courageous advocate for chronic pain patients, fears that her mental health is being destroyed and she is losing hope. Another constituent, disabled war veteran, Matt Walton, has been waiting in agony for treatment since 2019. Will the Minister work with me urgently to support Liz and Matt and can she confirm that any patients who need a vital pain relief injection will be offered a referral to another board if their own health board cannot cope with demand? Minister. So, firstly, let me reiterate again, I absolutely appreciate how difficult it is to live with chronic pain, particularly during the pandemic. Um, and that is why we are taking um, action to support patients and to ensure that health boards are making every effort to remobilise pain uh, clinics. We specifically highlighted the remobilisation of pain services as a priority in our first NHS remobilisation plan in summer 2020, and we further underpinned the specific and clear instruction to health boards via our recovery framework for pain management in September 2020. We provided advice for people with chronic pain during the pandemic, which highlighted relevant information on the matter of injections to assist them with their discussions with their clinician and their health board. And during the pandemic, we also explored if um, alternative arrangements for specialist treatments like injections could be implemented locally. But based on clinical advice and guidance from professional bodies, they concluded that it wouldn't be clinically safe in all circumstances. We will continue to work with boards to restart their full range of services as they continue to emerge from the latest wave of the virus. And as ever, I'm more than happy to work with Monica Lennon to improve the situation for the constituents she has mentioned. Question number seven, Fiona Hislop. To ask the Scottish Government how it plans to review and assess the pilots conducted as part of the strategy, the Best Start Five Year Plan for Maternity and Neonatal Care. Minister Marie Todd. We have established early adopters to lead the way and to test a range of Best Start recommendations, including continuity of care, the new model of neonatal intensive care. 
and the National Bereavement Care Pathways. These early adopters continue to develop, capture and review their practical experience of implementing recommendations, which has already informed development of guidance and standards to share with the wider maternity and neonatal community. And this will support planning as we prepare to remobilise implementation. The Scottish Government intends to evaluate Best Start and is working with Public Health Scotland to develop the approach. Uh, I recently met with a large group of midwives from NHS Lothian, including those with Best Start pilot experience. And they have concerns with the pilot measurement of continuity of care, the integrity of actual results, the risk to postnatal continuity in the model, and importantly, recruitment and retention of midwives. Can the Minister take a close look at the issues arising from the pilots and be prepared to meet with midwives and indeed mothers involved to ascertain the best way forward for continuity of maternity care, including the aim of reducing C-sections? Minister. Best Start Continuity of Care provides relationship-based care and is a key feature of high-quality midwifery care. The early adopter boards, including Lothian, were established to test implementation and to capture the learning from that. The Best Start Programme Board with the Royal College of Midwives undertook a deep dive into the implementation of the continuity of carer recommendations and their impact on work workforce prior to the pandemic. And the findings were shared with the early adopter boards and fed into the next phase of implementation. That next phase will also include publication of an evaluation framework developed by the early adopters to support boards and to measure continuity. And I have to say, I do look forward to meeting with midwives and mothers to hear about their experiences of the best start and to plan um, and to continue that engagement as we remobilise the programme over the coming months. So I'm more than happy to meet with your constituents. And question number eight, Craig Hoy. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the NHS recovery plan. Cabinet Secretary. As stated in the recovery plan, we have committed to reporting progress against commitments in the plan on an annual basis. The plan was published at the end of August last year and we therefore aim to provide the first annual update this summer. Craig Hoy. I thank the Minister for that answer. What does it tell us about the SNP Government's recovery plan? That a recent survey by RCN Scotland reveals that six in ten nurses are considering quitting their jobs. Cabinet Secretary. Well, we have a good record on uh, NHS staffing. In fact, we have record numbers of staffing in Scotland. Uh, we have the best paid staff in Scotland in terms of, uh, in terms of nurses and uh, qualified midwives. We have a decade of consecutive growth. When you look at Scotland, we have 95 GPs per 100,000. In England, where his party is in charge, that number is 78 per 100,000. So we have a really good track record uh, here in Scotland. That's probably why his party has ripped off our NHS recovery plan. Yeah. And supplementary from Julian Mackay. Thank you, presiding officer. I've been contacted by a constituent whose son is nearly three and has complex needs. My constituent has been informed by NHS Lanarkshire that her son may have to wait up to four years for an autism assessment. As we recover from the pandemic, does the, Minister, the Cabinet Secretary agree that this is unacceptable and what action can the Government take to support the Health Board to reduce waiting times? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, can I say from, from the offset to me that is not an acceptable wait. Obviously, I do not know the details of the individual uh, circumstances, so I would ask if uh, Ms Mackay has the consent uh, to do so to pass the details on to us and we would be happy to investigate them further. And supplementary from Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The waiting list for orthopaedic surgery in Scotland has risen from 21,000 in March 2020 to 37,000 in January 22. A patient added to the waiting list for hip replacement in January 2022 will wait between eight, 18 months and three years for surgery, depending on Health Board. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that this is an unacceptable time to wait for treatment and it is wrong that waiting times are determined by a postcode lottery? And what urgent action will the Scottish Government take to address this? Cabinet Secretary. Well, what I would say to the member is that, of course, the impact of the pandemic has undoubtedly exacerbated some of those weights. I'm not suggesting there wasn't, wasn't challenges before, but I think it would also be equally incorrect and inaccurate not to recognise the real shock that the pandemic has had. And that's why, uh, and I know uh, Ms Duncan Glancy will have looked at the NHS recovery plan, it does go into detail about those elective procedures and how we look to increase capacity by 10 per cent over the course of that plan. And uh, key to that will be the £400 million pounds that we will invest in, creation, in the creation of a network of national treatment centres which will help us get through some of those uh, 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 elective procedures so people will not have to wait the lengths of time at uh, the Miss Duncan Glancy references. 
Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes the portfolio of questions on health and social care. And I'll allow a very brief pause before we move on to the next portfolio of questions to allow front bench teams to change seats safely. Thank you. OK, uh, thank you. The next portfolio is Social Justice, Housing and Local Government. Again, if a member wishes to request a supplementary question, they should press the Request to Speak button during the relevant question or indicate so in the chat function by pressing, uh, entering the letter R. And I call question number one, Pam Gozov. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on homelessness rates in Scotland, Cabinet Secretary uh, Shona Robson. Um, tackling and ending uh, homelessness remains a critical priority for this uh, government, which is why we are investing £100 million between 2018 and 2026 to implement our Ending Homelessness Together Action Plan in partnership with local government. The latest homelessness rates, which were published in June 2021, showed that the average rate of homeless households per thousand population in 2021 was 6. One, um, however, we know that the impact of the pandemic meant that the 2020-21 reporting year was unusual, making year-on-year -year comparisons of homelessness rates quite difficult. Pam Gozo. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response. I recently supported the Homeless Veterans Project to rehome a veteran named Andy. Veterans account for around a quarter of all rough sleepers. Like Andy, Many veterans begin in unsustainable accommodation or temporary housing before ending up on the streets. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, will the Scottish Government help support veterans into safe and stable housing as quickly as possible by working with local authorities to nominate armed forces lead officers within their housing and homelessness services? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, Pam Gosal raises an important point, and um, it's very important that veterans are supported. I know there's a lot of good work going on around local authorities uh, to do uh, just that. Um, the rapid rehousing transition plans are uh, critical in making sure that um, people are moved into settled accommodation with the correct support. And we know that for a, a number of veterans, not all, but a number, uh, require that additional support for all the reasons that we fully understand. And that is really the best way of solving homelessness and will remain the focus of, of this, uh, the Scottish Government. But if there's more we can do and working with local authority partners um, and some of the suggestions uh, Pam Gosal uh, made, I'm happy to take forward and investigate further. And a number of supplementaries. First from uh, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First, it's clear that the latest statistics uh, are that there is much work. Uh, still, sorry, it's clear that the latest stats show that there is still a lot of work to be done. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that uh, what the latest data also makes clear is that councils and frontline organisations have put in a remarkable amount of work, uh, minimising the potential immense damage that the pandemic could have had on those rough sleeping or at risk of rough sleeping? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, throughout the, the pandemic, local authorities and, and frontline organisations have worked tirelessly to ensure people at risk of or in, engage, or in rough sleeping uh, a situation can access accommodation and uh, support. And this includes the eradication of night shelters in Glasgow and Edinburgh and those being replaced by self-contained rapid rehousing welcome centres. And I had the opportunity to visit the, the Glasgow uh, centre a few uh, weeks ago. Uh, councils and the third sector share our commitment to ensuring that everyone has a, a safe place uh, to stay and I thank them for the work that they have undertaken. And of course, the Scottish Government remains committed to working in partnership with them to end rough sleeping. A supplementary, Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary is able to say why the Homelessness Prevention and Strategy Group, which she chairs, 
has only met once since the election, given the rate of homelessness and whether she feels that they are getting the government support they need to implement uh, the next phase of the ending homelessness together action plan. Cabinet Secretary. Well, the prevention strategy group has a really, really important role to play and is getting on with the work um, in between meetings and uh, the coming together to check the progress of that work is really the, the aim of the, of the meeting itself. But I have engaged over the, the last few months with uh, numerous um, key stakeholders within uh, the homelessness sector and the housing sector who are working on this agenda. So there's no lack of meetings. What's most important, though, is the action from those meetings and making sure that the progress is made uh, to deliver the strategy to eradicate homelessness. And supplementary, Willie Ready. Cabinet Secretary, patience on this is, is running out. In 2012, this government promised to eradicate homelessness within months. That's 10 years later, 7,500 children were found to be in temporary accommodation. When is this government going to meet its promise to those children? Cabinet Secretary. Well, it's very clear from the feedback from stakeholders, which I'm sure uh, if Willie Rennie wanted to contact them, they would tell him this, not just me saying this, that we actually have the right plan uh, in our homelessness strategy. Uh, he will be aware that uh, we, it is not an easy uh, thing to do to eradicate homelessness. It is very complex, so which is why we now have the rapid rehousing transition plans, why we now have Housing First, which recognises that it's not just about bricks and mortar. It's also about the wraparound services to deal with issues around addiction, uh, around mental health and the other supports that people need. So we'll get on with the delivery of the plan. Progress is being made and we'll continue to work with our stakeholders and partners to make that progress. Question number two, David Torrance, who's joining us remotely. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support is given to local authorities to help tackle homelessness. Cabinet Secretary. So in 2022-23, uh, £8 million pounds of our £10 million pounds Ending Homelessness Together Fund will go to local authorities to support rapid rehousing transition plans, which help move people as quickly as possible into settled accommodation. We will also provide local authorities with resource of £23.5 million for homelessness prevention and response measures. And through the Housing Options Hubs, we are supporting all local authorities to share learning and good practice. And we are engaging with a number of local authorities to address key issues, such as aiding their compliance with the unsuitable accommodation order. David Torres. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. Does she share my optimism that the example set by Finland on their own successful Housing First programme is proof that Scotland is on the right track with its coordinated approach to prevent the homelessness across the country? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, the Scottish Government is, is fully committed to supporting local authority, authorities across the country to develop uh, Housing First programmes as part of their rapid rehousing transition plans, where a key component is, of course, the prevention of homelessness. And we're aware that 27 local authorities have developed or are in the process of developing their Housing First programme. Over 1,000 Housing First tenancies have started across Scotland to date. And the Scottish Government is working with partners on a suite of tools to support the continued scaling up of Housing First, because we know it works. A supplementary, Miles Briggs. Thank you, Deputy President. Officer. Last year, Glasgow City Council were able to recover £8.8 .8 million um, from the health mobilisation plan arrangement through its IJB, whilst Edinburgh was unable to recover at the equivalent cost of £9.3 million. I have raised this with the Finance Minister, but I have not heard any response to date. Um, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what her view is on that, whether or not that financial anomaly should be addressed? And can I also ask whether or not the Scottish Government intends to extend the tenant grant fund beyond March of this year? Cabinet Secretary. So, uh, first of all, on the tenant uh, grant uh, um, fund, we will be looking at a range of measures to support um, the recovery uh, from the pandemic to make sure that we sustain tenancies, that we avoid homelessness, and we also address the cost of living pressures that are uh, um, impacting uh, on families. Uh, on the health mobilisation plans, if the member does not mind, I will go and have a look into that and I will make sure either a response comes from uh, my office or indeed the, the Cabinet Secretary for fi Finance or, or Health. And supplementary, Pam Duncan-Glancy. 
Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Last week, new figures were published showing that Glasgow, Glasgow has seen a rise of 27 per cent in homelessness in the city. Glasgow City Council is increasingly failing to close homelessness cases and people are continuing to go without basic necessities like warmth, shelter and a place to sleep. Can the Cabinet Secretary set out what the Government is doing to support Glasgow City Council to reduce homelessness and does the Cabinet Secretary agree that cutting local authority budgets will damage those efforts? Cabinet Secretary. Well, look, we do not want to see uh, any increases in homelessness. Um, what we do know is, though, that one of the issues that we have in Glasgow, that I am sure the member will be aware of, is it is the largest dispersal area in Scotland for asylum seekers, and some of the issues there are impacting on uh, the statistics. Um, However, um, that, and I'm happy to write to Pam Duncan Clancy with a bit more information on that. Look, we work with all local authorities uh, to um, make sure their plans for uh, addressing homelessness are the right plans. Obviously, the, the Welcome Centre that I mentioned earlier on, I think, is a really uh, good centre, providing high quality advice and assistance to people. Uh, they are trying to get people into settled accommodation as quickly as possible and to reduce the use of temporary accommodation. Uh, there is always uh, a lot to do, but I think they have worked a really, really um, hard, along with stakeholders in the third sector, to reduce uh, rough sleeping uh, dramatically. Uh, but, of course, we can't be complacent, and I'm happy to write to Pam Duncan Glancy uh, with more specifics on what Glasgow is doing to tackle homelessness. Question number three, Russell Finlay. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government when ministers last met with officials from the Office of the Scottish Charity Regulator. Cabinet Secretary. So I met with the Interim Chair and Chief Executive of the Office of the Scottish Charity Regulator, Oscar, on the 19th of August uh, 2021. And I meet at least once a year with the Oscar Chair and Chief Executive, and my officials meet with Oscar staff on a regular basis. Russell Finlay. Thank you for that answer. Uh, most of Scotland's 25,000 charities are honest and do incredible work. However, over the last two years, 105 have been subject to regulatory action. Yet, Oscar have only published details of five of these cases. In the interest of public confidence and transparency, will the Minister urge the watchdog to show its teeth by routinely naming and shaming Scotland's charity rogues? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, look, I mean, I think the first thing to say is that Oscar are uh, an independent regulator and, and registrar for, as the member said, over 25,000 uh, charities in Scotland and report directly to the Scottish Parliament, not to the Scottish uh, Government. So uh, I think these are issues that uh, potentially uh, could be pursued through that route. I think Oscar uh, do a good job at overseeing and monitoring the charitable sector. Um, but if um, there is any more helpful information that I can give him, then I'll write to him with further information. Question number four, Karen Adam, who is joining us remotely. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on calls by the anti-poverty campaigner Jack Monroe for policymakers to take a more comprehensive view of tracking the full cost of poverty, as highlighted by the Vines Boots Index. Minister Ben McPherson. The Scottish Government commends Jack Monroe for bringing this uh, to the attention of the public and agrees that one inflation rate does not fit all. Whilst the Vimes Boots Index does not yet exist, it is proposed that it should be designed to reflect the experience of inflation for those on the lowest incomes. Therefore, I welcome the work that the Office of National Statistics is doing to develop and enhance consumer price indices to help us measure impact for lower income households uh, and to increase the range of products used to calculate inflation. Um, this initiative complements uh, this government's existing work to monitor progress in reducing poverty and income inequality, uh, and we look forward to monitoring its progress. Karen Adam. Thank you. Um, the Vines Boots Index sets out the socio economic unfairness that people on low incomes and in poverty face. Living hand-to-mouth means buying cheaper products which do not last as long as more expensive, well-made products. It is relatively more costly to be on a low income, and those earning the least bear the brunt of austerity the most. And the, can the Minister commit to ensuring that we look holistically at the true cost of being on a low income in Scotland and outline how this can be done? Minister. 
As uh, Karen Adam emphasises, lower income households spend a greater proportion of their income on essentials like food and fuel and are disproportionately affected uh, by the cost of living crisis. This is why we favour a cash-based cash approach uh, to tackling poverty so that low income households can spend money where it makes the most sense for their household. Uh, more accurate measurement of consumer costs as proposed by the Vimes Boots Index uh, and uh, as being taken forward by the ONS is a welcome step which will help to better understand and, importantly, address the impacts uh, for lower income households. Question number five, Julian Mackay. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it is supporting households that are facing hardship and debt as a result of the rise in cost of living. Minister. We are providing uh, immediate support for households during the cost of living crisis, especially those on low incomes. Our £10 million fuel insecurity fund, a part of our overall £41 million winter support package, is helping people to deal with rising heating costs. This year we have provided £25 million to local authorities to tackle financial insecurity, alongside £7.4 million of investment in free debt advice this year. Uh, and the Finance Secretary will set out further details on mitigating the cost of living crisis tomorrow. Julie Mackay. I thank the Minister for that answer. We have a Westminster government that has not only put a cap on benefits, cut universal credit and put up national insurance, but has also locked people into years of rising energy bills and concerns about how they heat their homes. When David Cameron told them to cut the green crap, they pulled the rug away from alternatives to gas, a decision which has added £2.5 billion to our home energy bills. Does the Minister agree that green energy is the key to reducing our reliance on gas and cutting bills, and only with the full powers over energy policy can we build a greener Scotland? Minister. The, the UK Government has indeed um, failed to this juncture to deal effectively with the cost of living crisis, which of course is very serious for communities and families all across the UK, all across Scotland uh, and for all of our constituents. Uh, we urge them to use their powers to the greatest extent, their uh, wide-ranging financial powers that, of course, this Parliament doesn't have to do more for people in communities across Scotland and across the UK. Of course, uh, the greater provision of renewable energy, uh, which, have, uh, although covered by another portfolio, is relevant to all of us as well, uh, has had a significant positive impact uh, on the reliability of supply here in Scotland uh, and as we continue to develop that capacity, that will be of benefit to uh, not just the environment, but to job creation and uh, wider public good here in Scotland. And yes, uh, we need to maximise the opportunities for renewable energy. And supplementary, Miles Briggs. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Um, research has shown that households which have prepayment meters often face additional challenges with fuel poverty. Can I ask the Minister whether or not the Scottish Government have spoken with energy companies with regards to the replacement of payment meters, and specifically what support schemes are being developed when we know that this is having an impact? Minister. The, uh, the, the Cabinet Secretary... Michael Matheson has, of course, indeed engaged extensively with the energy sector on a regular basis uh, and has been doing so uh, particularly in recent weeks as the cost of living crisis and increased energy costs have been uh, particularly pertinent. Um, the question of uh, engagement with the energy sector and supporting uh, consumers is, of course, something that the, the Scottish Government, particularly those on low incomes, uh, has been doing, uh, not just in the recent weeks, uh, but for, for some time. Um, for example, we have been providing £65 million of direct financial support to around half a million households uh, through our £130 pandemic support payment, uh, which was paid uh, by the end of October 2021. We are, of course, uh, committing to delivering this, uh, doubling uh, the Scottish Child Payment uh, from April onwards. Uh, we have invested in bridging payments. We continue to invest in the Scottish Welfare Fund and we have provided our £40 million uh, winter support fund, uh, amongst many other initiatives. So, uh, yes, we are, will continue to do all we can. I think Mr Briggs uh, raised an important point and uh, we will continue as a government to uh, consider the points raised and to help families as much as possible at this time. And supplementary from Evelyn Tweed, who is joining us remotely. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. While the Scottish Government has introduced game-changing policies like the Scottish Child Payment, this progress is undermined by a cost-of-living crisis that, which is being ignored by the Tories in Westminster. Does the Minister agree that while the SNP Government is using all the powers that is 
that are available to support hard pressed households is it the UK government which holds the key powers to make a difference? Minister. So, uh, President Officer, as I've uh, emphasised um, already, so far the UK government has unfortunately uh, failed to fully get to grips with the cost of living crisis uh, and has not used its many powers that are reserved to them to support people uh, in need. Uh, and we continue to urge them to do so. The Scottish Government will continue to use all of the powers available to us uh, to help hard-pressed households. As published earlier this week, uh, for example, we have supported uh, 530,000 households uh, with a £130 pandemic payment. In addition, we have our £41 million winter support package, helping people struggling with costs. And we also have a, a range of benefits, uh, which includes our five family benefits. Uh, one of these, of course, is the Scottish Child Payment, which we are doubling in April. Uh, question number six, Jackie Bailey. To ask the Scottish Government whether it anticipates that the lifting of the eviction ban in place during the COVID-19 pandemic will result in increased homelessness. Cabinet Secretary. The rental eviction ban was a temporary public health measure that ended on the 9th of August 2021, when the health protection coronavirus restrictions and requirement local level Scotland regulations were revoked. And this reflected advances made against the pandemic. Uh, since then, data from the first tier tribunal does not show any significant increases in repossession action compared to pre-pandemic levels. And existing measures such as the private landlord pre-action protocols tribunal discretion and the £10 million tenant grant fund are helping to sustain tenancies and prevent homelessness. And where evictions are unavoidable, we have strong homelessness legislation in place to support people. Jackie Bailey. Um, new figures from the Scottish Government show homelessness amongst private renters has soared by over a third between 2020 and 2021. Um, and I suspect this will in part be due to the lifting of the eviction ban, which we warned the Government was a likely consequence. The Government is set to close the Tenant Grant Fund scheme for struggling tenants at the end of March, despite the escalating cost of living crisis. So will the Cabinet Secretary say whether there are plans to extend this scheme or whether there are specific proposals to tackle the drastic rise in homelessness in the private rented sector? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as Jackie Bailey will be aware, the action taken at the time in terms of the, the eviction ban was based around the public health guidance at the time. And once that changed, you can't then impose a measure that was based on public health uh, guidance um, or, uh, because it wouldn't, have been, it wouldn't have been sustainable and it wouldn't have been sustainable uh, in the courts either, I, I would think. So what can we do? Uh, and as uh, I mentioned earlier on, I think in my response uh, to Miles Briggs, uh, we will be looking at what further measures uh, can be made. Of course, the Tenant Grant Fund is helping people in here and now, uh, and local authorities are working hard to make sure that those in both the private rented sector and the social rented sector who are struggling uh, with arrears and are at risk of homelessness are being helped uh, through that. And of course, we also have discretionary housing payments of £80 million, which are also helping uh, people who need that uh, support uh, with housing costs. Uh, we are looking at the moment as a government around what more we can do around the cost of living crisis. And of course, Kate Forbes will be uh, making further announcements uh, about support to families uh, tomorrow. Um, and we will continue to look at what more we can do across portfolios to support people uh, through the coming weeks and months, because we know the pressures that families will be under. And brief supplementary, please, from Willie Coffey, who's joining us remotely. Thank you, President Officer. The emergency measures on evictions were clearly effective during the height of the pandemic, but does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the longer term structural changes currently underway, prevention of homelessness are set to ensure a fair, stable system of support. Um, I, I'm afraid Mr. Coffey's uh, sound was not great. Did the Cabinet Secretary I get got, enough? I got to... the gist, okay. I, I think, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. So, I mean, yeah, uh, in, so we have the, 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 the here and now where we have to support. Uh, families, uh, particularly with the, the cost of living pressures, but we also need to make sure that we make the changes over the medium to long term that need to be made. 
Uh, so our, our goal of um, making sure everyone has access to a safe, warm, affordable, high quality and energy efficient home that meets their needs is our, our goal. Um, by taking further steps to improve accessibility, affordability and standards across the rented sector and preventing homelessness happening in the first place will help us to achieve uh, that vision. And the new proposals um, that are out for consultation build on the strong housing rights that already exist in Scotland, including through proposed new duties on landlords and public bodies and implementation of a national system of rent controls. Question number seven, Sarah Boyack. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to ensure that children living in temporary accommodation have access to permanent homes. Cabinet Secretary. Well, while it can provide a, an important safety net, Temporary accommodation must be of good quality and time spent there should be as short as possible, especially for families with children. The number of households in temporary accommodation is too high, despite efforts from councils, charities and other partners. The Scottish Government is supporting local authorities with £53.5 million between 2018 and 2024 to implement their rapid rehousing transition plans and housing first approaches. And these measures support councils to reduce the overall need for temporary accommodation, as well as the length of time spent in temporary accommodation. Sarah Boyack. Can I thank the Cabinet Member for that answer and can I draw attention to my register of interest? We have a housing crisis with Zoopla reporting today that average rents through their site in Edinburgh have risen to £974 a month. Only 14% of Edinburgh's homes are available for social rent compared to the national average of 23% and Scottish Government grant funding for homes covers only a fraction of the build costs. So will the Scottish Government commit to investing in Edinburgh to bring the number of social rent homes here closer to the national average? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'm well aware of the particular issues within Edinburgh, both in the rented sector and the owner-occupied sector. The housing situation here is uh, not replicated uh, necessarily in other parts of Scotland. So we do recognise that, and I've had a number of discussions uh, with um, uh, local uh, leaders uh, about that. What I would say, though, is that our support for the City of, of Edinburgh Council uh, uh, over the, the last uh, decade, uh, uh, well, 15 years or so, uh, has amounted to more than half a billion pounds in grant support uh, from the gov this government, which has contributed to the delivery of uh, over 13,000 affordable homes. Uh, the City of Edinburgh Council will receive a further £233.8 million funding for good quality affordable housing across uh, the capital over this parliament. And that is an increase of £32.4 million, a 16% increase on the previous five years. We're also um, making sure that we are responding um, and supporting Edinburgh's response to homelessness uh, with £3.3 million uh, for prevention. Uh, we have given them uh, over £871,000 for rapid rehousing, as well um, as a winter uh, fund for social protection of £563,000. Um, we have also supported their delivery of a rapid rehousing welcome centre in Edinburgh. Uh, I know there is more to do uh, in the City of Edinburgh, and we are supporting uh, Edinburgh along with other local authorities. And if there are innovative uh, measures that can be brought forward that Edinburgh want us to consider, then that is something that we would be happy to consider. Uh, question number eight was not lodged. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes portfolio questions on social justice, housing and local government. And there will be a short pause uh, to allow front bench teams to change safely before the next item of business. Thank you.